Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Charleston for this afternoon's event, which tackles the credit crunch head-on. Um, I'm delighted to be welcoming John Lanchester, Robert Skidelsky, and Edward Skidelsky. But before introducing our panel, I just wanted to thank our sponsor for this event, perhaps rather appropriately, EFG Private Bank. Um, <laughs> So to start with Robert, Robert Skidelsky in the middle is Emeritus Professor of Political Economy at the University of Warwick. He's the author of a three-volume biography of the economist John Maynard Keynes, former resident of Charleston. Um, and it remains, although it came out in the 1980s, I think, it remains the definitive work on Keynes. He's also the author of The World After Communism. Um, and in the 1980s, he was a founder member of the Social Democratic Party which he remained involved with until its dissolution in 1992. He writes for the Sunday Times, the Moscow Times, the Daily Telegraph, and the London Times. And he's an active and frequent speaker in the House of Lords. And I couldn't resist just quoting from um, Hansard from Monday. Um, on Monday of this week, it was the, the Queen's speech debate. And he said, um, quotes, Sigmund Freud identified a defense mechanism that he called denial, in which a person faced with a fear that is too uncomfortable to accept insists that it's not true despite overwhelming evidence. A good example of denial is the Chancellor's belief that austerity is a growth policy, <laughs> despite the fact that the British economy is shrinking. Um, I couldn't resist quoting that. His most recent book, written jointly with his son Edward, was published in March and is How Much is Enough? The Love of Money and the Case for the Good Life. John Lanchester on my left, immediate left, is a journalist and author whose work who's worked as a football reporter. He and I share a love of Norwich City. We're both Norwich City supporters. Um, he was a... Who was that? <laughs> Cat and out. No. Um, he was an obituary writer, book editor, restaurant critic, and he's written for The Observer, New York Review of Books, The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, and The New Yorker. And he's contributing editor of the London Review of Books. His novel, The Debt to Pleasure, won the 1996 Whitbread Book Award in the first novel category. It was followed by Mr. Phillips in 2000, and in 2002, he published Fragrant Harbour. Then in 2010, he published Whoops, Why Everyone Owes Everyone and No One Can Pay, a book that explained the financial crisis in terms that even humanities graduates could understand. <laughs> this was described as an intelligent, humorous, and eminently, eminently reasonable voice amongst all the gibbering. And in March of this year, he published his latest novel, Capital, which centers around the residents of a street in Clapham, where a spacious but hideous Victorian house can now command the price approaching 100 times the UK's median annual income. And sharing the event, we have Robert. Robert is co-author with his father of How Much Is Enough? Edward. 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 Sorry. Edward. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're so similar. So similar. Um, sharing the event is Edward. Edward is a lecturer and writer, currently lecturing in sociology and philosoph philosophy at the University of Exeter. His first book was on the early 20th century German philosopher Ernst Kassner, entitled Ernst Kassner, The Last Philosopher of Culture. He's particularly interested in moral and political philosophy, and having completed How Much is Enough, he's already hard at work on the following book, The Language of the Virtues. So please join me in welcoming Robert Skidelsky, Edward Skidelsky, and John Lanchester. Well, I'm, thank you very much. I'm going to start by um, reading out uh, a paragraph from our book. Um, this is actually written by Robert, this particular paragraph, but I thought I'd read it out because it might resonate with both of you. It's about Karl Marx, and it says, in fact, Marx was not an intuitive economist at all. No one who starts economics over the age of 40 ever is. There's too much other stuff in one's head. Economists have to start innocent of all distracting ideas. They have to have minds sufficiently empty to construct or accept those axiomatic models of human behavior which are their bread and butter. Late adolescence is the ideal time to start such a training. <laughs> now, I thought this might resonate with both of you because although you've both made a name for yourselves over the last uh, years as uh, commentators on the economic scene, you're neither of you originally trained as economists. Uh, John, you're a, a novelist, a literary writer. Uh, you've come to economics and finance through research on your, your um, novel Capital. Robert, you're originally trained as a historian. Um, so both of you, like Marx, have come late to economics. Um, and what I want to ask is, what are the 
advantages or disadvantages of this, this outsider's perspective. Um, John? Well, um, I, I think it's, um, I like writing about things that still seem fresh, and I find I can only um, communicate effectively when I'm finding things out. Um, the, more, the better I know a subject, the, the less able to speak the language I, you know, to, there's a gap between people who properly know and people who are outsiders to the subject. And you have to be, I find you have to be somewhere in the middle to be able to communicate effectively across that. And it's a massive issue in economics because economists speak a, a private language um, soaked in private assumptions and often with quite um, profound, they have whole models of the world built in to things they kind of casually and routinely think. Things like, um, that we consumers act to what they call maximize their utility, which sounds as if it doesn't mean anything, and in fact means something completely mad about the fact that we're always making these very accurate judgments of what our interests and what utilities are. And we all do that all the time, unthinkingly, all our lives. Um, everyone does it from you know, drug addicts, to people in housing estates, to um, you know, hedge fund managers. We're all acting to maximize our utility. They believe that markets are efficient always and permanently, and that that's a kind of rational thing. And the profession is full of these things that have really complicated, very, very contestable bodies of theory in that people in the field no longer see. They're invisible to them. They're just mm. assumptions. And I think that's, been, you know, that's the thing I've been most struck by about it, that it's a field that's actually full of um, things that people have um, entirely taken for granted. Yeah. So, so you're like the little boy who notices that the emperor has no clothes. Whereas well, uh, yeah, but a lot, of, a lot of economics is more, um, you know, there's also a lot of very, very interesting mm. stuff in it that comes quite fresh, and, and there's this big division between what they call macroeconomics, um, which if you could have to sum it up in a single word, that word would probably be wrong, which is this, <laughs> this whole field about, which Keynes more or less invented, Robert knows a thousand times more about it than I do, about the study of, it grew out of the study of the depression and an attempt to prevent it from, understand it and prevent it from happening again. And microeconomics, which is a sort of small, specific study of how people behave, of which there's a lot in your book, um, and a lot of which is very interesting. And I always think that, and it's about things like if you offer, microeconomics is things like, if you offer people 30 samples of free jam at a supermarket checkout, they buy less jam than if you offer them five, because the choice puts them off. Um, and another one that always really interests me is um, transsexual prostitutes. Um, that the economics of transsexual prostitution are different in northern and southern Europe. Um, in southern Europe, they charge less. So in northern Europe, they charge less. In southern Europe, they charge more. And that seems to be really interesting, and economics has lots to teach us about. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think economics is full of uh, interesting um, things, as John says. It's also full of sort of mad, mad things, which... Um, uh, Economists, economists have rather peculiar kinds of minds. They see little puzzle. They see something and they puzzle over it. And they come up with, a, with a, uh, something that they feel can be explained by economics. For example, um, uh, the model developed by the Chicago School of Rational Addiction. Um, most of us think of addiction as something that you know we can't resist i mean somehow we have to do it because like drug addiction alcoholism and so but economists say no um it's quite rational and and they have to say it's quite rational because they have a model in which uh, human beings are always rationally maximizing their, their 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 benefits and so it's all a matter of whether how you how you um arrange your preferences between the short run and the long run you see, it's quite rational. If you, if, you, if you want to maximize your pleasure in the short run, then it, it makes a lot of sense to take a lot of drugs. But if you're thinking of long run, your long run advantage, then you might not. But whatever course you adopt is rational. It, it, it fits within the boundaries of rationality. And they can't think of anything else. They can't think of it in any other way because that's the, that's the model of human behavior they're committed to. We always act rationally. We never act irrationally. Now, when they are confronted by lots of evidence of, of, of irrational behavior, as I think um, in believing that house prices would always keep going up which seems to be completely irrational, uh, then they have to find some rational explanation of it. And they're disconcerted. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit. So first, 
thing about you learn about economics, I think, if you haven't been uh, an economist all your life, is that it leaves out a huge amount of um, what n normally one think of as common sense. Otherwise, my, my, one might think of it of experience of life, virtually the whole of culture, politics, social life, <laughs> military life, and so on, which cannot quite be explained in these terms. And they are, after all, quite an important part of life, um, these, these things. And the other thing is, um, you realize how flaky it is as a science. Its claims to science are, are, are very, very, uh, really fraudulent. And curious enough, the people who realize that best are not historians, because they don't know much about science usually, but about people who are rather good scientists, like physicists. And when they switch to economics, they realize that economics is totally different. In physics, there really are laws. Um, I mean, you're playing against God um, as a physicist. You're not playing against human, human uh, tastes and things that change the whole time. So I think um, coming to economics late uh, has uh, a lot of advantages. I mean, the disadvantages, I don't know about you, John, but I, are you a great mathematician? Um, Maybe you are, actually. I'm not. So. Uh, A-level maths. A-level maths. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> uh, that, was back, that was back in the days before they handed out complimentary A grades. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> so, so what can be done? I mean, can we salvage economics? Um, can we, um, I mean, there are a group of people who you mention in Whoops who are trying to integrate economics and psychology. Daniel Kahneman and his uh, colleagues. I mean, is, is that the way forwards? You'd know better. I mean, one of the things that I think was interesting on that point you just raised is about the, the physicists, in some, some respect, almost caused more trouble, didn't they? Because some of the, you know, if you have um, uh, a sort of rocket science PhD, a lot of those guys now go and do work in the city and build models that are supposed to be um, guides to thinking and uh, aids to clear thought, but now are actually treated as if they are physical laws. Yeah. And in a funny way, the, the, I, I wonder if the physicists are almost the most dangerous people ever well, to have gone in. Because, yeah, because they're too young, you see. You need, I mean, most of the people who develop all these uh, new sophisticated mathematical models in, 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 in finance sector are very, very young. They, they, they've just got their PhD, so they're all bedazzled by the thought of doing for finance what physicists do um, for, for, for theorizing about nature. You have to be in economics um, for about 20 years having uh, to realize the differences. And it's people, people who are a bit older who come to this wisdom, this, this realization. So I think, you know, it's the teenagers. It's the teenagers who cause all the trouble, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I think part, part of the problem with the teenagers is, that, is the education they're being given. Because, you know, that, there's this course at Oxford called PPE. Um, so I think I'm right in saying the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, the Leader of the Opposition, and the Deputy Prime Minister, or maybe Clegg went to... Who's the Deputy Prime Minister? Clegg. No, Clegg really? went to Cambridge. Oh, I see. So it's, only, it's only the Prime Minister, I see. the <laughs> Chancellor, and the Leader of the Opposition who did PPE at Oxford. And um, but one of the things that's happened to PPE, politics, philosophy, and economics, is it's been broken by developments in economics. It used to be that you, know, you, you studied um, some, some Marx, some Hegel, and some Keynes, and they were sort of having a conversation with each other. And now the economics bit has completely drifted away. And that, asking your question about whether the whole drift in economics is fixable, it seems to me it is fixable as long as it's returned to where it used to be. It's not just being, um, you know, I'm told by someone who teaches economics at university that they know when the graduate students rock up, they're just given these assumptions about efficient markets, rational consumers. And go forth and build mathematical models. That's, that's all they do. And that seems to me uh, it is fixable. And the thing about models is models are quite useful. They, are, they can be a guide to clearer thinking. You can, like as Kahneman says, he studies mental mistakes. You can learn from your own mental mistakes. You can kind of coach yourself out of things like um, what they call hindsight bias, which is basically only remembering the times you were right. Um, <laughs> And you can, um, mm -hmm. you know, you can you can unlearn those things. But it seems to me that the whole discipline does have to take a kind of um, twist back towards um, back towards philosophy. But I'm a bit more pessimistic. It's 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 like once something has been dislodged from its foundations, it's it's actually very uh, difficult to attach it back unless there's a terrible catastrophe. And and I, I there arguably has been in, in ah, this. Ah, but it's not, it's not been big enough.
CR. You see, uh, it's really it's really a small catastrophe. I, of course, it's it's large in 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 in, in contemporary terms, but compared to some of the real catastrophes, like a world earthquake. A uh, worldwide earthquake, or or a, a, or a horrible war, or indeed like the Great Depression, it's really quite quite small, and people haven't suffered enough to um, blow up economics and and get back to Adam Smith and and some of the sensible. And so that's the pessimistic view um, that we have to have many more um, of these sort of crises before economics um, starts making sense again. And and, and uh, I, I know, I mean, I, that's a very depressing thing to say. In some moods, I do want to blow up the whole subject and start again. Uh, I think it's, a lot of it's become uh, rather regressive. And it, and, and it hasn't actually been abreast of things going on in other disciplines um, and, and, and advances in, in knowledge which, which are taking place in the adjacent disciplines. It's just now starting to take on board uh, uh, psych psychology and, um, and, and, and the study of the mind, uh, how people actually behave, rather than um, the idealized model of human behavior, which economics um, uh, uh, revels in. And, uh, and, and, and so there's this new branch, behavioral, behavioral economics. I don't know what you think about that. I've got um, mixed feelings about it. Very mixed feelings. It's interesting stuff, though. I mean, they're asking interesting questions. And Daniel Kahneman, who sort of founded the field, um, was a Jew who survived the Holocaust uh, in, in France and uh, then moved to Israel. And one of the, the formative experiences of his life was he was training people for the Israeli army and they used these officer training tests. And there was a particular one about getting, you building a bridge across a gap and all that. I think they still use it at Sandhurst. And he discovered, and he looked, and he thought what to do with it. And then he looked at data from previous tests and discovered it was totally useless. This, this test they completely relied on for selecting officer training candidates was rubbish. It had no predictive power at all. And, and from studying, thinking about things like that, you he created this new field which is based on what actually happens with our mental models, with how we see and study the world, and, and um, you know, the predictions that we make if we go back and test them, whether we're actually um, you know, using accurate pictures of the world all the time. It seems to me it's a really interesting field. I am a bit ambivalent about it because it has that slight, um, it's almost as if there's a slight autism built into the field of economics, that they miss very, very obvious things that are staring them straight in the face. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then when they finally do discover that they exist, they dress them up in fancy language. Yes. I mean, for example, hasty thinking and what's his other one? Slow and fast Slow thinking. Slow and fast yeah, thinking. Yeah. Slow and fast thinking, well, it sounds great. You've really discovered something about the way the mind works. Well, uh, hey, uh, um, fast thinking tends to be making judgments, snap judgments, and, um, and um, slow thinking tends to be thinking about what you're doing. <laughs> now, I mean, we all know that's what happens. We form an instant judgment about something, um, which is instinct. It may be right, it may be wrong, but it's, we have to do that, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to get it through life. I mean, we can't every time deliberate whether to cross the road or not and spend half an hour weighing up the chances. You take, you know that it's safe to do so at one moment, um, and, and you just do it. You may be run over by a car. There your instinct lets you down. But that's actually <laughs> the, the way most of us behave. Now, does one need um, a, a Nobel Prize winner to tell one this? Um, and, and I think it's an example of your autism. I mean, things that are crashingly obvious to um, most people um, have been educated out of Nobel Prize winners, and therefore, when they discover them, it's with this air of incredible wonder. I couldn't agree more, but there's a, there's a really interesting thing, though, in, in his stuff about how, about how details work. Yeah. It's very interesting from the, point, from the point of view of writing fiction. Um, that there's this famous example that people will pay more for insurance for earthquakes in California than they will for earthquake insurance for the whole of North America. It's been repeatedly proved, even though the whole of North America includes California. So by definition, that is always wrong to pay more for the California. People will pay more for insurance on Uzbek Airlines than they will for insurance on all the former Soviet, Soviet airlines lumped together, which again can't be, can't be rational because the Uzbek is just one of them. And, and there's something about, and so what we learn from that, there's something about naming the detail that makes it seem more vivid. Naming California as the location of the earthquake makes people kind of, their attention pop and they kind of believe in the possibility. Naming Uzbek Airlines 
uh, which, by the way, you'd never get me on, even with the assistance of the world's most powerful tranquilizers. But naming Uzbek Airlines makes it seem more vivid and more specific than just former Soviet airlines. And that's a very, very interesting thing about why details work in fiction, mm -hmm. you know, that there, there is something about granularity and particularity that does make things pop. And, though, and that is a provable, repeatable result, yeah. you know. That let, let, let me, let me um, as, as we're on fiction, let me ask you about your um, new novel, Capital. Um, it's quite unusual among modern novels in that you, you do go into quite a lot of detail about the world of finance, how it works. This is something most modern novelists shy away from. Um, and in Whoops, you say there's been a, a, a sort of, there's a modern version of uh, C.P. Snow's Two Cultures, uh, you know, the culture of finance, and then all the rest of us who just don't have a clue what's going on. <laughs> and you've tried to straddle these uh, two cultures in a way that not many novelists well, uh, try to. Um, I think it's partly that you know, it touches on themes in your book. In a way, I think, I think people would prefer never to think about money. I think in an ideal life, you would never, ever have a single thought about money, ever. And I think lots of people try and live that ideal version of life in, in this non-ideal version. Um, and there is a kind of gap in the culture about financial literacy. We, we don't want to have to think about it. And so a lot of people try, you know, s systematically try not to, even though these are powerful governing forces in... Uh, at the center of people's arrangements, people's work and all that. Um, so the thing that, you know, one way of describing what I wanted to do with Capital was to write a novel about house prices. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's such a kind of central thing of modern British life. It's a thing people are obsessed about. It's also, I notice, um, so I grew up mainly abroad, it's the only time British people openly boast about money. It's literally the only time it's socially acceptable to just boast about how much money you've got. And it always comes through the same sentence in its did you hear what they got for that house down the road? <laughs> and there's no other equivalent. People don't, you know, boast about their pay rises or things like that, but they will boast about house prices. And so I, I did want to, you know, examine that at some length about the kind of the blindnesses and the, the compulsions and the centrality of it in, in Britain today. Yeah, and, and it's also the press play, up, uh, play this up, don't they? I don't know when it was that um, every article about anyone who was in the news... Um, uh, had in it the price of his or her house, um, interviewed in their yeah. 750,000 pound hideaway, Mr. Bloggs confessed to having three mistresses. I don't know, whatever it was, it, the price of the house is always mentioned. When did that happen? I don't remember it happening when I was growing up. I, mean, uh, I noticed uh, my, a friend of mine, Will's house, it, it, uh, his house partly fell yeah, down last week. That's right. And, and the Daily Mail mentioned the price of the house before it mentioned the fact that they'd all survived. <laughs> he, he's doing all right, isn't he? He's, his house is, what, 1.2 million? No, it's uh, a, uh, allegedly uh, a million quid, but not it's anymore. not. Well, oh, not anymore. Exactly. Exactly. Quite so. In fact, it's only the bit on the front. Two, two good things. Firstly, it was the power at uh, the front of it fell off. Secondly, the Solicitor General lives next door, which is quite helpful when it comes to the, from the point of view of sorting out the insurance companies. Yeah, normally that happens when you're installing your underground swimming pool, doesn't it? Or, uh, or even better, when your neighbour is. When your neighbour is. <laughs> but do you think, I mean, as we're here, do, I mean, do you think Bloomsbury has some, you know, share of the blame for this sort of obliviousness of British literary culture to money? Okay. I mean, Virginia Woolf, you know, famously said, all you need as a writer is £500 a year and a room of your own. She didn't care where that £500 a year came from, as long as it came in regularly. Um, I, and maybe I, I, writers since her have sort of had that rather disdainful attitude to the... I think, you know, I, I, I blame Henry James okay. uh, in terms of the kind of attitude to money and, and the, the kind of fault in the, in the novel in, in England and in English in that they're sort of, this, you know, serious novels can't approach certain subjects without compromising their seriousness. Mm. I think that's James's fault. And you can actually see it in, I think it's in... Um, uh, it's in the ambassadors that, that the family fortune comes from the manufacture of a common domestic object of everyday use. <laughs> <laughs> so, what? And it goes on and on. And, and by the way, James scholars are completely obsessed with what that was. And, and the consensus, the dominant consensus, is something to do with toilets. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, you know, Balzac would have written a whole novel, Dickens would have written a whole novel, Thackeray, George Eliot, Jane Austen, they would all have been fascinated by, you know, by the by the toilet yeah. aspect. But James can't bring himself to mention it. And there's a kind of flaw after James. If it, if it is of immediate general 
mass interest as a subject, it automatically is slightly less literarily worthwhile. And, and, and of course, there was the convention that at polite dinner parties you um, didn't talk about, was it money, sex, and religion? And food, I think. And what did they talk about? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but, but, but it's also... I think this is not true in the United States, despite, I mean, Henry James didn't really spend much time there. But, I mean, um, in, in the United States, it seems to me money has always been a very, very important topic. Um, it's because people went, to the, uh, went across the, uh, the Atlantic to make money, and, uh, and, and they thought money was the royal road to success. Whereas here, either you knew you weren't going to make any money, in which case there wasn't any point talking about it, or you already inherited it, in which case it was impolite to talk about it. Whereas there, it was quite open. Um, so I think, I, I wonder whether American novels, I mean, I think they, they have much more, um, more uh, they're much more money focused than ours. Um, the other thing is that finance is very difficult. I, I think I'm, in, I'm incredibly full of, I'm full of incredible admiration for you, for, you, for the things you, you've done in the London Review of Books in particular, where the details of these, um, these, uh, uh, this, this financial innovation of the last 20 years are laid out <coughs> with unbelievable clarity um, and every, every, um, every indication of total understanding. Um, and <laughs> holy fame, <laughs> and um, and I think I think people get lost. Even I mean Roger in your in in um, in Capital, who he, he doesn't understand about derivatives. And I remember uh, always uh, also um, when we, as a member of a parliamentary select committee interviewing the, the then governor of the Bank of England, Eddie George, and we were we asked about it. We said, what about all these derivatives, Eddie? Well, it wasn't governor was governor, of course. I don't understand anything about them, he said. Well, he was actually the governor of the Bank of England. Um, and so I think a fortiori, people who are even more remote from that, they don't understand what's going on, and therefore they turn off, and therefore novelists don't write about them. Yeah. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I think that, that is right. Um, raising the, the question of what, was there a turn in the road? I mean, was there a point at which modern Britain could have not gone down this particular route. Yep, before Thatcher. I think Thatcher was the turn in the road here. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to sum up Thatcher in a phrase. Um, it's, she's too complicated a, 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 a person, and, 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 and her brand of conservatism is too complicated. To do it. But I think, um, in a way, the Thatcherite um, revolution unleashed what we call in our book insatiability, um, uh, which had been under some kind of social um, and economic controls in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and indeed earlier uh, right through. And so, somehow um, it became respectable um, to, um, uh, to talk about money and to want money and lots of money. Um, there was this writer the other day um, uh, who, who wrote, um, she's, I, don't know, I can't remember her name, she said, in the 60s we were all hippies, and then in the 80s we all wanted to make money. And she said, I don't think that was just a function of growing older. Mm. I think there had been a change, a, a, a sea change. Um, yeah. So that was the turning, I would say. Yeah, I mean, on, on this question of insatiability, mm. it's, I mean, it's a common theme in both your writings. Um, in, in Capital, there's um, a character, Roger, um, who's a city trader, um, and is looking forwards to a million pound bonus, which he actually needs to sustain his two houses, his nanny, his chauffeur, his, his very high maintenance wife, Arabella. Uh, and, and then he's devastated when his bonus turns out to be only 30,000 um, pounds. So he's a sort of classic case of, of insatiability. Um, or his wife is. Well, his wife too, yes. <laughs> um, and, and, and you know, we talk a lot about insatiability in our book as well. So. Uh, what are the roots of insatiability? Why, why do people always want more? Is it something that's sort of intrinsic to human nature or is it a product of our particular civilization? Uh, it's really interesting that, I mean, because the, uh, and it's a really interesting way you use, use the word in the book, because um, people often call it greed. And, and, but I'm not sure it is greed, because greed has, you know, greed is, Greed applied to economic things is largely a metaphor, isn't it? Because greed is, you know, you're stuffing things in your body you can't stop yourself. Whereas with, when it's with earning, I think insatiability is, more, is a much more suggestive term. I mean I don't fully understand it. 
as a thing. I think it's a really interesting thing in the culture. You, you, you say, in, you know, I was very struck by the bit where you talk about, you know, wanting, keeping wanting more and more money open-endedly is by definition, I think you say ill. Yeah. But there's an awful lot of that about, though, isn't there? Yeah. Because people, people actually don't, just as an observed fact, people don't, those guys never stop. You know, they never get to a, or almost never kind of get to a target and then stop. And that's a really strange quality. There's some, something almost abstract and intellectual about the desire to keep going on for more, keep going on, keep going on, keep going on. It's almost like, um, it's almost like an idea rather than an appetite. Well, I, I, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. I'm not sure that it isn't um, a sickness. I, I think... I think um, just to go on accumulating is plainly irrational because you always sort of, what is money for? And um, to want more and more money is um, like um, wanting to eat more and more in order to get fatter. I mean, it, it's sort of, it's, it's a sort of sickness. Um, it would ob obviously be irrational if, 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 if you ask the question, why are, you, why are you eating more and more? Because I want to get fatter. Eating is for a purpose. Eating is to maintain health uh, or, or just stay alive. And so there's, there is rationally mm. a, an end, and there must be rationally an end, uh, a sort of purpose um, for money. Uh, and uh, so one always asks, what is money for? And as soon as you ask, what is money for, you should be um, aware then of a limit, um, the, uh, 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 the existence of limits. And then what those limits are um, is something that, that is then the next question. But what we argue in our book is that money is in order to enable you to lead a good life, it, a healthy, to remain spiritual, to, main, to be spiritually healthy. But beyond that, there's no obvious reason to go on accumulating money. And I think our, our argument is that um, in rich civilizations, the urge to um, accumulate more and more money should be falling off. Instead, it seems to be getting, as you say, more and more, more and more um, uh, uh, rampant. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I completely take the force of that, and, and, it, and it speaks to a thing that I've long been fascinated with. And, and start, the starting point in the book is this wonderful essay of, of Keynes is about what life would be like for the grandchildren of his generation and speculating that basically the world would have got so much richer that no one would really need to work more than a bit and we'd all be living this sort of paradise, paradisical life of leisure. Um, and interestingly, his economic prediction's pretty much on track and yet, you know, paradise doesn't seem to have broken out and uh, particularly in terms of working less. They work 50-hour week then and 40-hour week now, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Which is really striking. And that's average, of course. Average. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people work a lot more. But I'm, but I'm wondering about those people who have that. Um, the thing about insatiability is w when, when, you, when, you say, when you start asking what is money for, at that point you've already lost them. Because if you, to that, they would immediately say they don't get it. If, they were, if there was one of any of those people in this room right now, they would already have concluded that we completely don't get it. Well, would they, would they say the same if you asked them how much is enough? And, and, and then they would, um, they might, I mean, when we've asked people how much is enough, they'd say, well, they would say, well, enough for what? And as soon as they say enough for what, then immediately they are asking themselves a question. Now, they may not be able to answer it properly, but at least they'd know that um, accumulation without end is, is not rational. I mean, I think that people would, would understand that. But there is, I mean... The um, late American billionaire, H.L. Hunt, I think put his finger on it when he said um, money is just a way of keeping score. Um, in other words, it's a way of uh, you know, seeing how you're doing against your competitors. Yeah. And, what, and, and once you look at it this way, of course, no sum is enough. I mean, mm. And you talk about that in the book, about mm. positional goods, as they call mm. it, that it's a, a, a relative thing. I mean, there's, there's um, uh, a, a someone no one pays any attention to, an Italian economist called uh, Abbe Galliani in the 18th century um, said this thing about uh, la ricchezza è una relazione tra due persone. Richness is a relationship. So in other words, richness is all about that. And if that is the case, if that's where we are in our culture, this is probably unfixable, isn't it? Well, um, 
what, what, what was it that fixed it before? Um, after all, I mean, to take, the, the, um, to take a really anti-money view of things, what was it that kept the world poor for thousands of years? Um, after all, insatiability must have been, I don't know that human nature has changed, but um, insatiability was kept in check in some way or other. It was always there. Everyone knew about it. Augustine condemned it as, a, as, the, as the deadliest of the sins, love of money, greed, and those kind of things. So it was under a strong set of moral taboos and customary restraints. Now you say, well, there wasn't very much opportunity for people to get rich in, in previous times, but it was the unleashing of um, the love of money that actually produced the economic miracles of the last 200 years. People suddenly knew that, that, that there was a way of getting rich, and, um, and, and that, was the, that was the function of capitalism. And I, I think one of, one of Keynes's uh, ideas was that cap once capitalism had done its job, it could be retired, you see. Um, and it, that's what it was for. It was a bad system, but it had all these good results. It could be retired, and then we would go back to what he called true virtue, valuing the present over the future, today over tomorrow, living like the lilies in the field, and so on. So he had this utopia beyond capitalism, and it hasn't turned out that way, or it hasn't yet turned out that way. Um, and I think he ignored the, uh, the, the uh, importance of relative wants. Mm. Once you start comparing your fortune to others, um, then you immediately, as, as you just said, Ed, there seems to be no obvious limit. So you've got to get back to some idea of virtue, of some idea of the good life. Mm. I'm, I'm gonna, on that note, I'm going to read out a passage from Whoops where this is right at the end. Um, John, you say, we have to start thinking about when we have sufficient, sufficient money, sufficient stuff, and whether we really need the things we think we do beyond what we already have. In a world running out of resources, the most important ethical and political and ecological idea can be summed up in one simple word, enough. Um, and of course, yeah, that, that is... How much is enough? Exactly the title of our book, How Much is Enough? Amazing coincidence. Um, uh, uh, about, Michael, about, about 40 grand, by the way. <laughs> uh, Michael Sandel, the, the Harvard philosopher, has just written a book called What Money Can't Buy uh, on a rather similar theme. So are we seeing a sort of uh, sea change in public attitudes at the moment, a sort of revulsion against market values, do you think? Maybe a bit. Um, I mean, you know, there's often a bit of a time lag between the, you know, um, the thing happening and the reaction in, in the debate, and I think this is a, a reaction to 2008, um, to whether we've gone too far down this particular track. Um, I, I, you know, a, a place that I think would be really interesting to see is whether there's, you know, we haven't had a kind of mass popular turning away from accumulation since the hippies in the 60s and then punk in the 70s. And I, I think it would be very interesting if, to see if something like that manifests itself. Uh, I know, you know, uh, and of course if it were to happen it would be kind of affluent, well-educated young people would, wear, would be starting. And I've seen a bit of that, you know, that recent university graduates who pride themselves on doing what they call free cycling, which is passing things on for free, and freeganism, which means basically eating out of the bin. Um, and that's what you do after you get your first in PPE. Um, and so I think it is possible that they'll, they'll and, be... And uh, become an hour unemployable. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you become Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and, and so I think there's been kind of glimmers of, a, of, a, of an accumulation around, around, of kind of momentum around, around these things. I mean, um, and I, you know, I believe what I wrote and I deeply want it to be true. And I, I suppose exactly for that reason, I'm also a little bit pessimistic because my, my concern is that, you know, on the, it's very hard to, we were talking about this about journalism just before we came on. You know, one of the things that you see happening in Leveson is people talking about actually a, mis a value system that the profession lost. You know, those things have to be internalized. You have to, they have to be so deeply felt that you're not really thinking about them, ethical principles. And I think the thing about the revulsion about, you know, the, greed used to be quite a powerful bad thing. I'm not that old, and I can remember greed being a, a vice. Vulgarity used to be quite a strongly negative Quality in Britain. Restraint used to be quite an important virtue. 
I've seen all those things vanish from the public discourse as virtues in my adult lifetime. Yeah. And, and I do wonder if, in trying to reverse those trends, what we're really, you know, we're actually trying to make fish out of fish soup. Well, I think, you know, what is, what, how, 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 de how, 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 how long lasting will be the effect of the current recession it, on attitudes? It obviously depends to some extent on how long it lasts. But it is quite easy if you're suddenly made unemployed to believe that you ought to spend more time with your family, um, uh, whether you're made unemployed in politics or anything else. Or, but, a, or a politician caught diddling his secretary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quite, uh, exactly. But um, uh, once you're employed again, uh, then you might drop that, unless you actually come to believe that family is very, very important and should, should, gen should always be put first. In other words, unless you have a positive view about such things as family, health, uh, uh, dignity, um, uh, the importance of community... Um, rather than things you're simply thrown back on when everything else is collapsing, you're not going to um, ha have a change in attitude because the economy will recover. They always do, uh, sooner or later. Uh, someone will invent something new, some new Facebook, uh, whatever it might be, and then, every, then it'll start up again. And then all this will fly out of the window. So there has to be some moral... Um, some, some moral movement. In, in, uh, but then things have to be really bad. In, just, just one example. In, at, the, at the end of the Roman Empire, in the last couple of centuries, when the Roman economic system was really in a state of free fall, there was a widespread move uh, to, towards monasticism. I mean, people just gave up um, any, 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 any concern with the world and, and, and entered, into mon entered monasteries. Monasticism was, was, was a product of prolonged collapse in the economic conditions of, of, of the society of that time. So, is anything like that happening? Are the hippies and, and, and other people um, mod modern monks and nuns? I don't know. Well, the, the irony about the hippies is they went on to become incredibly effective capitalists. Yeah, I know. I mean, so, did, so did the monks. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 <laughs> it, took, it took, took a bit longer. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, isn't one of the troubles that, I mean, unlike the 1930s where you had some alternative ideologies in the wing, communism and fascism, okay, they, you know, we don't think they were great, but at least they forced capitalists to sort of, uh, you know, try and win, win over the workers. Now, now we've got nothing like that, or at least nothing that I can see. That's one of the real surprises since 2008, isn't it? That there hasn't been a kind of a really sustained ideological challenge to capitalism. That you know, um, the idol toppled off the altar, and then everyone looked a bit embarrassed and shuffled around a bit and, and put it back up. Yeah. But, but that's because uh, the, there'd been a, a couple of gods that had failed, and um, our, our failure was was then in the future, and 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 and, and we 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 haven't got anything to replace communism with. Um, socialism was implicated in the failure of communism, and very few people um, talk, uh, talk of themselves, in main, mainstream politics, politics, talk of themselves as socialists. No one um, uh, uh, talks of themselves as fascists, um, although you can see in some of the crumbling political structures of Europe the reemergence of um, right-wing extremism. Um, but they call themselves other things. Um, so I, I think there is all this happening, but there's, it, it, there's, no, there's no ideological home for any of it, really. We have, capitalism remains, in one form or another, the only game in town. And we, am I right in thinking that you, that you think that we can kind of change the conversation by changing people's attitudes to the values? That that's where, that's where the the debate can be kind of shifted rather than the economic models, political systems, as we're getting people's values in order. I think that's what we do, do believe, don't we? We, we, think, we think it needs a bit of encouragement from the politicians. Yeah. Um, uh, we think, um, well, policy needs to be shifted to make it easier for people to actually live according to these values. And at the moment, it's pretty hard for them to do and that. And we, we need people, I think we're saying, first of all, we've got to be clearer in our mind what a good life is. And it's not just um, doing what you want. And it's not just um, a Western view versus an Eastern view so that you can have...
many different culture, cultures of a good life. We, what we found was that if we go around the, all the cultures at all times, there's a very big overlap in what people think of as uh, are, are, are the constituents of a good life. So there isn't as much disagreement as, as I think we, we might believe. And once we can state that and argue for it and, and people can be persuaded, then they can orient some of their everyday activities to realizing it in their own lives, and then governments might um, also nudge people towards it in social policy. After all, governments do a lot of nudging already. For example, there are things called sin taxes. Um, uh, uh, this is a term of art. But I mean, <laughs> you know, sin taxes, you're not allowed to advertise certain things. Sm uh, tobacco, um, I think alcohol, uh, certainly pornography. Lots of things that the government deems to be unhealthy for us, physically. Well, okay. we Fine. can extend that. Okay, let's, um, let's throw it open now for questions, as we've got about uh, 20 minutes. Um, lots of hands. Um. Well, thank you very much for a very entertaining session. Um, as a psychologist, I felt very disappointed in some of the things that you said. Um, you mentioned Freud at the very beginning and then nothing after that. But I would re like to remind you about for love or money which is very much in our vernacular. And that I think many people in my profession would see money as power and, and in exchange for not being valued. So we have lots of people who were sent to public school at eight and didn't know what it felt like to be really loved. And there's an example on stage where this man is very much approved of by his father, actually writes a letter, uh, a book with him. And so he doesn't need to make loads of money and be in the city. And I think this is very serious, really, that since um, whenever, since perhaps Thatcher, people haven't felt very valued in themselves from broken homes or in competitive societies. And so they've needed to get very rich, more and more rich, the insatiability that you talk about. So I'd really like you, if you feel like it, to say something about that. Well, I, I think it's hard to, you know, uh, the, I think it's hard to locate these things historically. You know, it's easier to see the direction we've travelled than the causes of it, and it's perhaps easier to see the direction we've travelled than the, than the fix. Um, you can't make people love each other more, and um, you know, you can't legislate for people being a bit nicer to each other. Um, I, th I think it's. You know, the kind of crises in um, economics and value and all that, uh, it's hard not to see how we have to address them in the short term through means of economics and value, even if the kind of profound manifestations of it are at the level of individual unhappiness. Yeah, I think, I think um, you're, you're absolutely right in the sense that I mean, one, of the, one of the things that people talk about, I think sociologists, but obviously these are things that have enormous psychological impacts, are the sort of decay of family, families, um, and um, the um, increasing kind of, uh, um, in a way, our society has become much more individualistic. I mean, these, these groupings have become uh, less important. The family has become less central as an institution, the community has become less central. People talk about the global village and so on. But, uh, and, and, but Facebook and virtual communication isn't actually the same, as to, in, to my way of thinking, as face-to-face as -face communication. Therefore, in a way, there are lots of substitute, substitutes being set up. Um, and, 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 and the main one is money and money making, that is your indication that you've succeeded and that you're, you're, you're loved. So I, I, I go along with that. I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that's absolutely right. But then you get back to the question of one of our basic goods is actually friendship, but by which we mean, we mean to include family life and all the affective relationships which people, um, which people get go in, uh, not only get into, but regard as essential for their substance. Now, how do we get back to that? That seems to, well. We have to realise that's a good thing. Then I think some of the pressure for making more and more money will will recede. So I agree with you. Okay, the gentleman at the back put his hand right up at the. Could we keep the questions and answers quite short, as we've got lots of them, please. 
I think the debates become rather theoretical. Um, looking back over the financial crisis and before that, I think the outstanding feature is that whilst overall wealth has been going up, it's been accruing more and more to a minority. No one so far has mentioned the massive growth in inequality, whether you're talking about here, America, or even China. And surely, if you're talking about the, the purposes to which wealth should be put, you need to address the fact that a minority is massively better off. But for most people, frankly, um, it's the first case where the next generation isn't wealthier than the last one. So it's very theoretical. Well, I, I agree. I think uh, a very small proportion has accrued the massive uh, majority of the productivity gains over the last 30 years. There has been a growth in inequality. I agree. And it does make, it makes societies unhappy, measurably unhappy and um, measurably functionally worse. Yeah, I mean, I think inequality is, um, in a sense, it's the um, background, to, you know, it's the, um, the canvas on which this picture is, modern Britain is painted. I mean, inequality is completely fundamental to where we've ended up. Um, I'd like to agree with the first speaker from the floor. I was quite surprised at the lack of emphasis on power in the discussion about money. Money is power. And that, <laughs> the lack of money is an absence of power. And I think I'd also perhaps refer to the 1970s and when the first American corporate president was paid a million dollars and suddenly every American corporate president of a, you know, one of the hundred largest companies had to be paid a million dollars or he was underpaid. So power and status seem to me extremely important. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, now I'm just agreeing with, uh, with the comments. I think power is crucial to understanding, for example, the, um, the, the, the dominance of the financial services sector. At a certain point, there was a sort of marriage between the, the free market and, 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 the, and, and the financial system. It's just that uh, um, uh, that group of, of power holders um, uh, or that group of the economy um, took power essentially in the United States and, and then spread um, um, uh, around the world and they, they, they enforced their ideology or uh, they spread their ideology to everyone. Why that shift in power took place is bound up also with the question of why you had this big shift from um, uh, manufacturing to financial services in our economy. But certainly the 1970s, 80s is where you're going to look at it. The, the connection between ideas and power is endlessly fascinating and, and one could go into it. But uh, I've been told by my son to keep my answers short. <laughs> I, I mean, curiously though, although the financial sector is much more powerful and you know, effectively writes its own rules, which is why we haven't had any change since 2008, uh, from the novelist's point of view, the thing that's really interesting about people in that field is they don't feel powerful. That to a really quite striking extent, maybe it's to, to related to what the first question of Ray brought up, they feel aggrieved and misunderstood and wronged and cross. And you know, I remember um, overhearing um, someone, who, a banker's wife in 2009 when there was all the fuss about bonuses saying uh, in a French accent, oh, my husband is working for free this year meaning he was only getting 300 grand. He wasn't getting his annual bonus. And there is a quite striking thing, although that sector has enormous amounts of power, the people who work in it don't, don't at all feel that about themselves. And they, uh, particularly at the moment, feel bitterly, bitterly wronged by the tone of the public debate. Do you think they... Sorry, I just want... Could I... Uh, yeah. Do you think they... Yeah, I, I think there's something in that, but I also feel they're playing a strategic game with the government. You know, the, everyone says, look, the banks aren't lending. Uh, why? Um, and uh, the bankers say, well, it's because the government is imposing all these new uh, regulations and, 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 and charges on us. But is, aren't they saying that? Aren't they, aren't they also playing that particular game? To say, uh, the, the conclusion to which is, yes, okay, we will lend, but you withdraw a lot of your... Mo uh, onerous regulations. I mean, yeah. there's something. So that's a power struggle within within the power elite. I agree. I mean, they basically they've got a, they've they've got our puppy on their lap, and, and the puppy is uh, lending to small businesses. 
the, the, the met metaphorical puppy on their lap, they're holding a gun against its head, saying, yeah. Yeah, be careful about regulation or the dog dies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, satiability didn't actually start with Thatcher. Samuel Pepys, every year in his diary, calculated the last farthing how much he'd earned in the previous year. The 18th century literature is totally preoccupied with money. 19th century Dickens, Myrtle in Little Dorrit with Robert Maxwell, where we live now, Trollope, totally making money, capitalism in the extreme. They were, it was turned off Henry James, I agree. But today, the problem facing the world, and this is where your book is interesting, is that basically electorates won't accept austerity. Whatever you may believe, whether austerity is the right policy or not, we, have to, we live in an austere world, and politics won't accept it. Um, uh, in the Greek position, the, the, the extremists are going to win. Uh, Sarkozy has lost. If there are elections in Italy and Greece today, the anti-austerity people win. So the problem is, what happens when the music of capitalism stops? And that raises fundamental questions. And the, the person at the back, back, back asked the same question. There's a very good play in London now called Love, 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 which is all about the, um, the, boomer, the, the, bakey, the, the baby boomer generation, most of the people in this room, they had a wonderful life, tremendous life, a tremendous 50 or 60 years, and the, the last act of this play is their daughter of 37, who's just, her boyfriend has left her, she plays the violin, she says, Dad and Mum, buy me a house. <laughs> buy me a house. It has, the music mm. has stopped, and this makes enormous problems both for economists, which you are in writers, but also politicians. How do you persuade people, in fact, to actually cut back and, and extend their retirement age to 65, 67, 68, 70, and in fact not go on cruises every other year and all the rest of it, and cut back? It's an enormous problem for democracy, which hasn't been faced, actually, since normal democracy has existed. Uh, I completely agree, but it, it, it is linked to the, what the question at the back said, in that uh, I think it probably is do doable. I mean, I think it probably is a, a manageable thing, but it places tremendous emphasis on solidarity, on people being in it together. I think people are willing to make shared sacrifices, but I think um, the, the, the thing that, um, the fly in the ointment, is people don't perceive the arrangements as being fair, they don't perceive the sacrifices as being shared, and they don't see inequality reducing as they're losing goods themselves. If everyone is losing, it's easier to take. <laughs> Yeah, and I think there's another thing, Kenneth. Um, I think although everyone in the 19th century talked about money and knew exactly what the funds were doing and all that, it wasn't consumption. That wasn't, the, that wasn't at the center. Uh, it was saving and, and, and actually um, uh, uh, not spending. I mean, you didn't live, you didn't spend your capital. I mean, that was the, that was the, uh, that was the fundamental principle of it all. You lived quite... Uh, austerely, actually, um, and you hope to then leave your capital to your next generation, uh, to your children. But now we spend and spend and spend. That's the change. And I think that change um, actually really starts. I mean, oh, it's been developing. I really think it starts um, with um, uh, the government under which you serve. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will. Hello, I'm not sure that this has lost its momentum or not, but I was struck by how important it was that you were, get, you, you were getting to a very important place about values at the end, to which the first questioner responded. But it struck me as how different it was where you ended from much of what you'd said throughout, which was very much about the language that marketplace economies are in, which is all about rationale, whether it's rational or not, or irrational. And if you forgive me, because gender came up this morning, and I still think it's important, but it's another facet of a gender perspective, which is very male-dominated in the markets, um, which actually belies the fact that rationale is a defense like anything else. And a Freud, to go back to the Freuds, because we have a lot to learn, I think, from psychoanalysis when it comes to the markets, and it's not been explored enough, talked about, it's a more sophisticated rationale, uh, defense. It's not as primitive as some, but it's still a defense.
But what you never talk about, of course, is uh, because of course men hate to not be rational, is the hysteria in the markets, another Sigmund Freud concept. It seems to me that the marketplace is a place of hysteria more than rationale, and that has never been addressed. And unless we get at the unconscious dynamics of the complexity of what the reality of the marketplace is, with, with the bleakness and emptiness of its soul, then I don't think we are actually going to address some of these solutions that I would totally support about the notion of insatiability. So, I mean, um, um, I had a, a friend who's planning to write a book about it called Studies in Male Hysteria. It was partly about that. <laughs> Uh, it's an unwritten book with a very good title. I completely agree. Yes, I, I think that I think in talking about um, the importance of psychology in understanding behaviour, I think one has to be very aware that there are not just two schools but several schools. And I, I think uh, I think um, uh, some of the uh, couple of the questions we've had have come from uh, obviously uh, a psychoanalytical uh, perspective. But when when people are talking about developing behavioural economics uh, now, they're not in they're not. Freudian at all. What they want to do is to uh, um, acquire a more a knowledge about how the brain works, not the unconscious, but the brain, and, and therefore be able better to understand the basis of conscious decision making. Um, and um, uh, by doing that, they um, I hope uh, eventually uh, to be able to um, reduce the area of irrationality. Um, so I think it, it's, it's, a different, it's a different perspective, and that's really what economists are interested in. I wish they were interested in the other as well. It is very deep to go into the subconscious and, and all these uh, deeper meanings while this whole economy is imploding upon us. What the gentleman in the back said, it is about inequality. What that gentleman said, we don't accept austerity. Have you got two children at university? You don't know what austerity is. There's a whole generation of us who are living in austerity because we have no other option. What the bothers us really is inequality. Bob Diamond, who straddles in and said, the bankers have been punished enough. I mean, what nonsense. The fact is, they brought down the economy, they all got their bonuses, and they still get their bonuses. It's inequality, period. Do you want to say anything or shall we no, move on? Okay, I think... Yeah. Um, we, we all love to blame the politicians and we love to blame the bankers for where we are. I'd like to ask a question about the psychology and the culture of debt. I was brought up as a child in the 50s and 60s and my father imposed on me the principle that you never go in debt, you never overspend. Now across the whole of society, debt has been, became acceptable over the last 20 or 30 years. Why? I, I mean, I think one, you know, there's one, um, I, um, me too, you know, I can remember when debt was regarded just uncomplicated and straightforward is a very bad thing that you didn't want. I think uh, the simplest and most brilliant thing that uh, the financial services industry did to debt was a, a one-word change. They renamed it credit. <laughs> and, you know... And, and, we, and we can all understand that you don't want debt, but credit sounds like a good thing that people want more of. And um, ba basically, people took on more and more debt in order to narrow um, the consequences of inequality. Their incomes weren't going up, so they borrowed more so they could spend to have that lifestyle they could see just slightly further up the economic pecking order. And I think the things are intimately linked. Yeah, I, th I agree. Um, neither a borrower nor a lender be. I mean, that was one of the oldest injunctions. What, what, obviously, there was always borrowing. I mean, there was always debt, but it was sort of more bus for business, not for households. What changed the household attitude? Well, I'd, undoubtedly, one can think of two things. One, as you say, was uh, the invention of credit cards. 
uh, and they renamed the debt credit. Second was, was of course, um, the encouragement of home ownership um, by, by, by governments, um, uh, our government, the United States government, where you were encouraged to get into debt in order to acquire your home. And you were encouraged to. I mean, there was actually tax advantages. And I remember people saying, you must, uh, I mean, in, in, when, I was, uh, when I was starting to earn money, you must, you, you, you don't have enough debt, they used to say. I mean, this is not an optimal amount of debt for your income. Um, and so uh, I think governments have to t take, take part of the responsibility for, for, for legitimizing, for making respectable households getting into debt. And people who borrowed for houses didn't think they were really getting into debt. I, I've got a mortgage, yes, 90% of my income, that's perfectly all right, you know, that kind of thing. They didn't think of it as debt, but it was. That was debt, and uh, it was encouraged. Gentleman in the middle. Um, since banks create money, is it safe or sensible to allow our money supply to be created by private profit-making institutions? I don't know enough about economics to be able to answer that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Well, um, the, 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 the private profit-making institutions are um, uh, considered to be under the control of the Bank of England, which is a, which is a, a, a state institution. Um, and uh, that, there's, always, there's been a game going on between the, 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 the private banks commercial banks and investment, and the Bank of England. And what's happening now is I think people have been responding to exactly your question, um, realizing that somehow the regulation of money got out of control, it collapsed um, in, in, the, in the 1990s, 2000s, and now they want to uh, re reassert the control um, of the Bank of England over the money-creating powers of the commercial banks. So the question is a very valid one, and I don't know how it will be resolved, but it's an old debate about who actually creates money. Banks create money, but someone is meant to control the creation. The lady. Um, it's just a simple question, really. Um, is it time for Plan B, and what will happen if it doesn't happen? Um, I th the short answer, uh, in, from my point of view, I mean, I don't know anything about economics. One of the, one of the things is whoa, that... Whoa, 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 whoa. No, I don't. <laughs> no. But it's a bit like, you know, um, William Goldman wrote this tremendously good book about show business um, called Co um, Confessions from Hollywood. And, um, you know, his conclusion about the mo movie business, summed, the whole book summed up in three words, nobody knows anything. And you know, alarmingly, I think that's true of the economy as well. Uh, insofar as I do know anything about it, yeah, it seems really amazingly, glaringly, obviously, urgently time for Plan B. Yeah, um, I, I think they, they will, they will, they should have um, turned to Plan B. They will turn to Plan B, but they'll go on calling it Plan A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. I, I, I'm sorry, I know there are lots of questions left, but we have now run out of time, so... I'd just like to thank our two speakers. I just wanted to echo that thanks to Robert, John and Edward for a really wonderful event. Uh, it's been incredibly entertaining, thought-provoking um, and very amusing. Um, we've seen evidence of fast thinking, very little evidence of slow thinking. I shall now be operating primarily on a hindsight bias basis, um, and I hope my team here at Charleston will note that. Um, while economists might indeed speak in a private language, we've been very fortunate in having the three of them as our, as our translators this afternoon. I'm dying to be able to drop into conversation over the next few weeks um, something about the economics of transsexual prostitution. So don't be su you know, surprised if that does come up. I've come away with two notes for future festivals. The first is we're going to introduce speakers um, in future by announcing the values of their properties, which I think will be <laughs> quite, a, 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 quite a positive change. And then the debate next year, I think, has to be um, which is more evil. Is it physicists, uh, economists, or teenagers? I think that'll be a really good one. Um, I would like to say on behalf of Uzbek Airlines, or rather their lawyers, um, 
that their flights do have um, over a 70 percent success rate. So we just wanted to clarify that. Um, I do hope that this afternoon will have led you to um, want to read these two incredibly uh, good, entertaining, wonderful books. Um, and based on our own economic modelling, which is based on our assessment of the predictability of all of you here, uh, we have got some copies on sale in the shop at the back. So anyway, please join me in thanking John Lanchester, Robert Skidelsky, and Edward Skidelsky. <laughs>